record this. So if Chris needs to uh, press anything, please do. Um, I think it's underway. I think, I think Is it underway? Okay. Uh, I'm also going to try and share my screen. So oh. can everyone see a, a starting yes. page? Okay, yes. great. Mm. Uh, well, you don't really need to see this. It's just about me. Uh, <laughs> And this is an overview of Alan Turing. Again, hopefully most of you realise, I guess, the, the interest in uh, Alan Turing in Oxford for me started when we had a meeting all about Alan Turing for his centenary uh, in parallel with Cambridge, Bletchley Park, Manchester, etc. Uh, and also my original interest really came from uh, Andrew Hodges, who is the definitive uh, uh, biographer of Alan Turing and is based in Oxford, so that at least is one connection with, uh, with Oxford. Uh, this was the meeting we had. Uh, you may recognise some people here. Uh, our last speaker you'll see in a moment, but uh, th these are various <laughs> people with Oxford connections, including Robin Stephen Wolfram, who I, I was at school with in Oxford, also an Oxford undergraduate. Uh, and, uh, another person influenced by uh, Alan Turing in mathematical biology. Uh, Cliff Jones, computer scientist, uh, mm -hmm. interested in the history of computing, who Troy knows very well. Uh, our previous speaker, you might recognise himself <laughs> in Oxford sometimes, uh, and me, so also computer scientist, uh, and uh, well, still based in Oxford, I'm li living in Oxford. Uh, and we had the happy birthday, of course. So this is when I, I guess I first started really getting interested in Alan Turing. Uh, but of course, there's, so there's all these locations where Alan Turing was known to have a lot of uh, connections. Uh, this is above. Uh, but then, you know, we celebrated Alan Turing in all these places, but also in Oxford. But uh, as, when this happened, as far as I know, there was no actual written sort of archival evidence of Alan Turing ever having been in Oxford. Uh, there's some circumstantial evidence. Uh, there's a little bit more evidence now. So this is a sort of... Uh, Detective story. Unfortunately, there's no absolute uh, ending to it. It's it's ongoing, uh, but I'll tell you where I've got to so far. Uh, so looking at his connections, well, his father was a, a scholar at Corpus Christi College in Oxford, and uh, Andrew Hodges records that he did come, the fa whole family came to Oxford in the summer of uh, 1924 when uh, Turing was still a child. Uh, so again, no, nothing actually written, but uh, so if anyone knows of a letter that says this or et cetera, I'd be very interested. Uh, but I believe he, he must have come to uh, Oxford uh, in his childhood. Uh, going on to the war, uh, this is something that Andrew Hodges pointed out to me that uh, Bletchley Park had part of its, well, the, the government code and cipher school, uh, part of it was based at Mansfield College in Oxford during World War II, uh, the security section. And of course, there was the Varsity Line, the railway line between Oxford, Bletchley and Cambridge. One reason why Bletchley was where it was, conveniently halfway between Oxford and Cambridge. So it would have been very easy for Alan Turing to come and visit this place. He may well have uh, had to uh, do some liaising with it and so on. Again, nothing written. Uh, so this is a plea for anyone who knows anything written with such a connection, that would be very interesting. Uh, so I used to give a, a talk on, well, I still do give a talk on Alan Turing in general, uh, and saying the, he's got all these connections, uh, but did he actually ever visit Oxford? And one time I did this talk, it was actually in Chongqing in China, and somebody goes and puts their hand up and says, yes, I, I know about a connection of Alan Turing in Oxford. Uh, of course, it wasn't actually a Chinese person. It was one of my former colleagues, Jim Woodcock, uh, now at York, uh, but he was attending the, the lecture in, in China at the time. Uh, so he told me this story where he'd been to a, a party with Herbert Hart in Oxford, uh, who was based at Bletchley Park during the war, uh, later his professor of jurisprudence at Oxford, uh, and also uh, Arthur Goodhart, who was at University College who was also the subsequent uh, Professor of Jurisprudence, uh, later Master at UNIF. Uh, and he says that uh, Herbert Hart 
told him during this, uh, I think it was a, a, another lunch in Oxford, uh, that there was a visit to University College with some Bletchley Park people, including uh, Herbert Hart, uh, but also with a visit with uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, well, this is quite possible because he was uh, based quite near Oxford in Sonning for a while uh, and so on. And certainly he was very interested in Bletchley Park and things going on there and knew how important it was to the war effort. So he would have wanted to liaise with uh, Bletchley Park. Uh, he also knew Arthur Goodhart, who, who was a fellow American. Uh, and he says that Alan Shoring was there. Uh, I guess one thing that sort of makes it ring true is that he said that Alan Shoring made an inappropriate remark about one of uh, Dwight Eisenhower's aides. So I'll let you uh, work out what he might have meant by that. Anyway, so that sort of started me off thinking, well, I'd like to try and find something more on this. Uh, so uh, I've done a bit of investigation. I've talked to the archivist at uh, UNIF, who I know quite well, uh, Robin Dowell Smith. Unfortunately, there aren't many records at UNIF during the, the war, so he couldn't find anything written. However, he did mention, you know, Arthur Goodhart was not very much an Anglophile American and friend, friend of Eisenhower. Also, uh, William Beveridge was master at the time, and he says he would have loved to have uh, met Eisenhower. Uh, so you can imagine uh, a connection there with Arthur Goodhart, maybe uh, forming a bridge uh, to come come and uh, visit UNIV. Uh, so I thought, well, I better find out when Eisenhower, did he ever visit Oxford? So I uh, contacted the Eisenhower archives uh, in, in the US, and uh, they were incredibly helpful. They were back in a day or two and said, yes, there are two known times or known dates when Eisenhower was in Oxford. These lay on the screen, 1st of October, 1920, 1942, and 16th of April, 1944. So these seem like possible likely dates when this uh, lunch with Bletchley Park may have happened. Uh, now there is the uh, beverage archive is in the London School of Economics because he was later went on to, to lead the uh, LSE. Uh, and if you look up online, you'll see, yes, there are pocket diaries of beverage. Uh, there's the master's lodgings visitor book uh, in the archive. So I thought, well, this is going to be good. I, I can go and have a look at these. So I registered to uh, uh, join the library uh, LSE. Uh, the pocket archive, sorry, the pocket diaries are very disappointing. Uh, there's hardly any entries in them, certainly none to do with the two dates are shown above. However, the, the visitor book was a, a little bit more interesting. So you can imagine probably such a, a lunch might not have been in hall, but might have been a bit more secret and held perhaps in the master's lodgings. Uh, and looking in the uh, entry for the master's lodgings visitor book, uh, 16th of April 1944, a list of names of lots of Americans. Uh, well, I thought this is when my sort of hopes uh, raised, rather, seeing all these names. Uh, I sent the, this back to the archives set in, uh, in the US. Sadly, none of these names made any uh, sense to them with respect to Eisenhower, so that was slightly uh, annoying. Uh, but looking at this, you'll, you'll notice there's one name, rather a scrawl, and most of these had uh, places like New York and uh, uh, Pennsylvania and so on, but one of them says something like picture something. Uh, and I couldn't understand what this was and spent a long time trying to work out what picture might be. Uh, and eventually realised this is Picture Post. Uh, and this is a, a name of somebody maybe associated with Picture Post or maybe a, a journalist. Uh, so I thought I'd better have a look at Picture Post. Uh, well, I, I don't subscribe to the archive for picture posts, you have to pay money, but I do have a friend who uh, uh, subscribes to the London Library, so I asked him to look at the picture post uh, for a, a few weeks uh, after the uh, April date. Sure enough, there's this very interesting article uh, all about uh, beverage, who you can see there on, on the left and right. Uh, the photos are by uh, Hans Baumann, who, who changed his name to Felix Mann because he, he was German. Uh, origin and wanted to disguise that. The uh, text was by Margaret Stewart, who also signed the visitor book. Uh, and actually, Beveridge was uh, used to inviting American soldiers to visit uh, the master's lodgings during the, the war on Sundays for tea. Uh, 
obviously there were a lot of soldiers billeted at the time waiting for D-Day. Uh, so we know that uh, Beveridge was in Oxford at the time. Uh, we, we know that uh, uh, Eisenhower was in Oxford on this date. Uh, I, I asked them in the, the Eisenhower uh, archives what was Eisenhower doing at lunchtime. Uh, the visits were actually to uh, see people who were in hospital, who were uh, colleagues of his uh, in the army and so on. Uh, but there's no record of what he did at lunch. So I guess we have some circumstantial evidence that uh, the master was in Univ, uh, Eisenhower was in Oxford. Uh, uh, we have uh, HLA Hart saying there was a, a, a visit by Eisenhower uh, to Univ. Uh, so certainly there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that this might have happened, but sadly still nothing written. Uh, <clears throat> so that was exciting, but uh, sadly, nothing written. So if anyone can find anything written, that would be wonderful. There are some other records, uh, well, not written records, but this is a, something that Hodges uh, notes that uh, he says there was a weekend visit of uh, Turing with uh, Joan Clark, who was uh, briefly uh, engaged to Turing. Uh, and her brother was in Oxford, Martin Clark. Uh, and so we think that probably Turing came to visit uh, during the war at some point. Uh, also, David uh, Champernon uh, was in Oxford after the war. Uh, he collaborated with Turing on an early chess playing program, Turing Champ. Uh, so he had several uh, meetings with Turing about this. Probably some of them are likely to be in Oxford, but again, nothing written. So anyone who can find a letter saying, come and visit me in Oxford and so on, that would be wonderful. Uh, so looking at other connections with uh, Oxford of uh, Turing. Uh, I've, I've looked at his academic advisor tree uh, and he was supervised by Alonzo Church in Princeton uh, but there's a number of people with uh, Oxford connections so one of his fe fellow students of church was Anna Scott, uh, someone later than, than Turing as you can see there, in fact about 30 years later uh, so of course they didn't know each other uh, but uh, he Turing supervised uh, Robin Gandhi, who was at Cambridge, but then moved to Oxford. Uh, Diana Scott supervised Jack Copeland, who was uh, very much a, a Turing scholar, uh, knew Robin Gandhi at Oxford. They were there at the same time. Uh, Robin Gandhi supervised Martin Highland and, and quite a lot of other students. So there's quite a lot of uh, Oxford uh, connections uh, indirectly there on his uh, advisor tree. Uh, certainly has a lot of influences of Alan Turing in Oxford. Uh, so R Roger Penrose, uh, with his books, has written about AI and computability and has used the ideas of Turing for those. Uh, of course, we have Andrew Hodges, the, the Turing biographer, who's been based in Oxford most of his career. Uh, Philip Maney, who you saw in the uh, picture for the celebration in 2012, is based at the Mathematical Institute doing mathematical biology, which uh, Turing would uh, produce a, a foundational paper on. Uh, Christopher Strachey knew and worked with uh, Turing directly in Manchester and then went on to found the programming research group in Oxford. So very much a sort of Turing influence with that, with a sort of formal background, mathematical background uh, to computing. Uh, and Samson Zabramski, who is now the Christopher Strachey Professor at Oxford, is uh, computer scientist, theoretical computing, is very much uh, uh, interested in uh, Alan Turing and, and it, I believe influenced. Uh, of course now have, there's the Alan Turing Institute in, in London, but there are quite a lot of data science researchers in Oxford, they have their own website there, so we have an Oxford Turing website there noted below. <coughs> Uh, of course, the influence that uh, I've been influenced by uh, uh, the meeting in 2012. So we went on to write a book with which I'm sure quite a lot of you know about uh, with Robin, uh, Jack Copeland, who, who was at Oxford, as I mentioned, uh, and Mark Spravak, who's up in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, now, this is slightly uh, off to the side, but uh, Oxford is the sort of place where you go to meetings. So Robin, as you know, is very much a Lewis Carroll fan and does a lot of things with the Lewis Carroll Society. So I went to one of his 
meetings at the Mathematical Institute. Uh, and of course, you chat to your neighbour at, uh, uh, at the meeting. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I'm busy writing a book on uh, Alan Turing with, with uh, Robin and others. And he said, oh, I have a, a letter by Alan Turing. <laughs> Uh, and I just, uh, just before that, uh, there had been a lot of publicity about a postcard that had been sold for uh, £28,000, I think. So I said, well, that might be worth quite a lot of money, uh, uh, if you didn't know. Uh, he got this letter because uh, it was written to Alan Turing by his uh, mathematics teacher at Sherborne, Donald Epperson, uh, who was also a Lewis Carroll fan. And actually, this mentions a puzzle book of Lewis Carroll. Uh, because Turing was interested in uh, buying uh, his uh, uh, puzzle book. Uh, so you'll see, so include, if you read, he sent a check for seven shillings to, to get a copy of the puzzle book. Uh, and there's some interesting information about the Festival of Britain and so on. But it's not a long letter, but it is signed by Alan Turing, as you can see, and it's in his own handwriting. And there's very little uh, written by Alan Turing in his own handwriting. So. Uh, not long after that, uh, this went to Bonhams for sale and went for £75,000. So anyone who has any Alan Turing letters, uh, <laughs> you, might, you might have won the pools. Uh, the, the person who sold this said he used it to, he's, he's not so mobile now, so he's got a nice new lift in his house to take him uh, uh, upstairs. Uh, so yes, do let me know if you've got any uh, uh, letters for, from Turing. And, Yes, sadly, I made no money out of this. So if anyone does, <laughs> I'd like a small commission, at least a, a bottle of uh, champagne or something. Uh, so as you probably know, there's a lot of blue plaques for Alan Turing uh, uh, in his birthplace, his death place where he lived and so on. Uh, but of course, no blue plaque in, uh, in Oxford for Alan Turing. But uh, very recently I discovered there is a blue plaque associated with Alan Turing, only installed last year in July. Uh, and it's for Joan Clark uh, up in uh, Headington Quarry. Uh, this is her house, Seven Lakeside. It's a very modest house, I think, given that she's had Kira Knightley uh, acting her part more recently. I can't imagine mm -hmm. Kira Knightley living in this house. Uh, but there's a nice blue plaque on it there. You can see it at the bottom right on the house. Uh, so if you're if you happen to be up in Headington and want to do a little uh, uh, visit, uh, I can highly recommend doing that. So there is a little uh, connection with Alan Turing there. Uh, so of course I've told people like uh, Chris Hollings about this and suddenly he says, ah, I know of a, another possible visit of uh, Alan Turing. I, I, I've got the information, I can send you a, a copy. Uh, and this is uh, Ion uh, James, who was another mathematician, a student at the Queen's College in Oxford. So there's a nice little connection with the, the history of mathematics group. Uh, and he wrote in the college record, uh, uh, another mathematics lecture worth mentioning was Alan Turing, who told us uh, about what became known as the Turing machine. So it sounds like this was a lecture in Oxford. This is all we have. Uh, and James is still alive. Uh, he's based at uh, uh, St. John's. Uh, so Chris Holling said, try and contact him there. Of course, I thought I'd walk down to St. John's, but with COVID, you, you turn up at most colleges and there's a big door, no letterbox, nothing, you can't get in. Uh, but at least I've actually posted a letter to him and asked them to forward it if they can. Uh, so I'm waiting to hear whether he can remember more uh, about this lecture. Sadly, there's a little bit of doubt because at the end, he mentions that he, he caught TV whilst he was at Oxford and spent a, a, a year in Cambridge recovering. So. I don't know whether his memory is of a lecture in Cambridge, where Turing would have been at that time, uh, or whether he would have come to Oxford to give this lecture. So I'm hoping that he might get back to me and with more memories and be able to say definitively whether this lecture was in Oxford or Cambridge. So I'm hoping it's Oxford. But, uh, at least this is something more of a, a written record. Uh, so I'd say thank you to Alan Turing. Uh, oh, the, the, what I've written so far is online, so that's the DOI if you want to find it. I think I've sent it out in a, a letter to most of you, uh, email. Uh, I'm probably going to update it now with the info from Chris Collins and, and so on. Uh, so uh, that's where I am at the moment. It's uh, ongoing. If anyone can help, I'm very interested to know 
any other connections with Alan Turing, especially if there's anything written, because there doesn't seem to be anything really uh, very much written about it. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any quick questions? Does anybody know if Mike Wood is still with us? I believe he is. Uh, but I haven't checked recently. So, yes. So, does he know much about Turing in Oxford, though? Or, or? I honestly don't know. It's just that he no. worked for that family. Yeah, yes, I know. So, and he was a very helpful guy to me at one point. So, right. if he's around, he might help. But I don't okay. know. Okay. Well, I'll, I could certainly give it a go and see if he's, he knows of anything along those lines. Yes. Thanks for the suggestion. Marty? Uh, so you mentioned David Champernat. Uh, yes. His son, Arthur, is alive. And uh, I exchanged some documents with him recently. Champernat was uh, composing music on the ADSEC in Cambridge in the 60s. But he might have kept some correspondence with Turing that oh, is right. not in the, in the archive. OK, if you've got any sort of way of contacting, if you could email me, have you got my email address? Yeah, uh, let's, let's exchange emails through Chris. Yeah, I think. yeah that's fine. Well, well, I'm on the list. Uh, I'm jpbowen at gmail.com. Uh, okay. So, yes, I'd be very interested in uh, see, trying to correspond. Thank you. Just a, a general question, if I can, Jonathan. Uh, yes. With both you and Robin being the authors of that, uh, excellent book, The Turing Guide. Uh, I just wonder how available his sort of, I mean, he mentioned he very rarely wrote anything or very, very few records of him writing. Just how much material was generally available when you did the research for that book? And did his, let's call it the, the, the later issues with the law, have any problems with where stuff is kept or removed or whatever? Right, well, there's a lot of stuff written by Alan Turing, but not in his own hand. So there's, there's the uh, digital archive at uh, King's College in Cambridge, and, and uh, Jack Copeland has his own online archive and so on. And Jack Copeland has published a lot of Turing's material in other books uh, with commentary and so on. So actually, you know, technical writings by Turing, there's quite a lot of. I believe there's still some that are sensitive uh, even to this day, Martin Campbell Kelly might have more comments on that. So, some things have been released from Bletchley okay. Park gradually, but I think there's still some that haven't. So, certainly, Jack Copeland has said he's seen some things that aren't allowed to be shown. I don't know if they are by now. Do you know any more, Martin? Um, <laughs> I'll take you offline. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, that, well, I'd be interested to know where, where we are with that. Yes, offline, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, but, but I think we have, you know, a lot of stuff from Alan Turing. I mean, we're, so the key thing is uh, for something being worth money is, is it actually written in his hand? So more recently, there was a, 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 a booklet written by Alan Turing at Bletchley Park that uh, was given to Robin Gandhi, uh, who added more material to it, in fact. And that passed through when Robin Gandhi died, passed to uh, on. And, and that was sold uh, in... Uh, US, I believe, and that went for a million dollars. So, you know, if you have more than just a letter, a letter you're talking about uh, tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, if you've got if you've got something longer than that, you could be up to in the ten hundreds of thousands or even a million. I mean, there, there was something there was something very odd on the Antiques Roadshow about a couple of years ago about a discovery of Turin. I, I can't remember what village or city they were in, but. You know, I, I'm not sure if, if uh, everything's kept in the Bodleian or in, in the in college records. There must be various sources, aren't there, where odd visits and odd trips are captured. Yes, I think there is more to find. I mean, there's some things in at the LSE. Even I found some some things uh, in yes. there. You know, any short things. But if, I'm sure if you went round looking at archives uh, in general. Uh, I mean, LSC, he was writing about, so he was reviewing a paper. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was the material going to and fro about saying, he was saying it's not a very good paper, I think, and, <laughs> uh, you know, with the editor and so on, and explaining why. Uh, so, so I'm sure looking at more archives, we might find more yeah, uh, excellent. like that. 
there are the silver bars that he buried to be found somewhere, but it sounds like this is small fry compared to the cost of sending the papers off, letters off. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, certainly they found more, you know, they found a huge stash in, in uh, Manchester of uh, letters associated with Alan Turing, most of them not, you know, typed rather than handwritten, so that makes them worth a little less, but there certainly is an interesting uh, collection there. I mean, it's a typical university of having a filing cabinet that's been kept for decades, <laughs> nobody's looked at, and now in the last few years, somebody opened it up and said, oh, there's some stuff by Alan Turing there. So, so, you know, there may be more filing cabinets like that. Maybe there's one at NPL, or et cetera, that's just been sitting at NPL for decades and nobody's ever opened. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, welcome to Adrian and Deborah, whom I, I didn't have a chance to welcome earlier. Uh, just to say um, that uh, for next time, please let Chris know in the next two or three days whether you want, you're happy to stick to 